Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Reinhard Bütikofer. I want to welcome you all warmly to our webinar today uh, that is going to discuss a uh, review published by the European Court of Auditors um, titled The EU's Response to, to China's State-Driven Investment Strategy. And to discuss that, I want to welcome first and foremost Anemi Turtelboom, a member of the Court of Auditors who was the main author of that review. And uh, um, Mrs. Turtelboom um, has a long and distinguished career. She served as minister in the Flemish government. She served as a parliamentarian. And I will not read your long CV. I just I want to express my gratitude, Mrs. Tuttleboom, for your willingness to offer this opportunity of an exchange of views with regard to what you have found in your review. But we are also happy to welcome three experts that will give their own comments on uh, the uh, ECA's report. And those three experts are Maria Martin Pratt, who is uh, the uh, uh, main negotiator for the uh, China uh, investment agreement that has been uh, languishing for long and might be moving forward now, but she's also uh, the uh, um, uh, leader of the uh, areas of service, investment, intel intellectual property, and public procurement uh, with uh, the uh, DG Trade. So um, uh, she's a, a, a very dear uh, collaborator uh, with the Trade Committee. We already met this afternoon. Then we have Inge Bernertz, who is uh, a director of policy and strategy at the uh, uh, DG competition. Mrs. Bernertz um, uh, used to be uh, heading the cabinet of Commissioner Marianne Thyssen uh, for uh, several years and she has worked um, uh, in the Energy Directorate General of the Commission. So uh, we we'll welcome uh, Mrs. Bernertz also. Um, and last but not least, we have uh, also a male participant, Miko Huatari, the executive director of uh, the uh, uh, China think tank Merix uh, in Berlin. Um, the number of participants uh, is um, um, about 80 at the moment, and they hail from European institutions, from business, from perm reps and regional representation offices, from think tanks and from journalism. So uh, be aware that this is a public conversation and uh, you're, uh, you will possibly be quoted whatever you say. But uh, I hope that doesn't keep anybody from uh, uh, being as frank as possible. And I know that Mrs. Turtleboom loves being frank. So Mrs. Turtleboom, uh, I would say that you go first, and then we have the comments. And after that, we will have the Q&A. Welcome again, and please take it from here. Well, thank you very much. You were too kind in your introduction. And um, it's true, I like to be frank. So and I hope that we were also Frank, but uh, mainly right in our uh, the review that we wrote. So good afternoon also, ladies and gentlemen. And once again, thank you, Mr. Butikover, for organizing this webinar and for giving me the opportunity to present our review in the EU's response to China's state-driven investment strategy. For this review, 
we looked at the responses of both the EU institutions as well as the member states towards China. We identified three documents that sum up the EU's response. is the 2016 EU strategy towards China, the 2018 strategy on connecting Europe and Asia, and the 2019 EU-China strategic outlook. After reviewing these documents, as well as publicly available information on Chinese foreign investments in the EU, we present six future challenges, which I will now discuss with you before opening up the floor to all your questions. And on the next slide, you will see the Chinese foreign investments in the EU, and I would like to call them a black hole for data, and I will explain it further on. Our review process highlighted the problem of a lack of or incomplete data in the area of Chinese foreign investments in the EU. Looking at the official FDI statistics, which you can see on the slide and also in the annex of our review, does not give a full picture of Chinese investments in the EU for various reasons, including the time lag in collecting and publishing these statistics, and the fact that these statistics only show the origin of the immediate investor. That is the reason why Luxembourg is the first ranked on this slide. Furthermore, there is no publicly available inventory of official BRI projects, nor is there an inventory on member states' contributions to financial institutions that involved in the BRI, such as the Asian Development Bank and the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. The first future challenge we highlight in our review will be to provide more complete and timely data and statistics on these investments. How can the EU develop a European strategy towards China without having reliable and complete data? Without an accurate picture of the current state of, affair, of affairs, big problems such as the lack of reciprocity or a level playing field between European industries and their Chinese counterparts cannot be properly tackled. And let's not forget that these Chinese counterparts are all state-backed, which gives not really a level playing field. On the next slide, you can see that there is no comprehensive risk analysis. And it, this leads us towards the question, is the EU driving blind towards China? Well, it certainly appears that we are all sailing without a compass, as we found no formalized comprehensive analysis of the risks and opportunities of the China's investment strategy for the EU. Our own compilation, and it was actually the first of its kind, is the first step towards a framework for the EU and its member states to evaluate the costs and benefits of ties with China. As an example, you see here in table two, we see aside the risk of lack of reciprocity in the EU-China relations due to the unfair economic advantage of the Chinese state-backed industries. We also know that Chinese sectors are less open to European companies and investors. I will elaborate on that in my, on my next slides. So if you want to take not only the risk of reciprocity, but all the risks that are here described in this table, and as you can see, it are 18 risks, from a European perspective, it is crucial to have at least a clear mapping on all of the risks and use this as a starting point to develop a strategy. Currently, we are fighting the crisis caused by the pandemic. And while the cooperation with our international counterparts will be necessary to tackle the crisis, the future of the EU-China relations must also balance the need to promote and preserve EU values. For projects such as infrastructure, member states should take into account the lessons learned by other countries and their experience of the BRI where excessive debt could lead or led to um, where the excessive debt led to um, uh, 
co a pro possible loss of strategic collateral. This is one of the considerations we outline in our compilation of risks and opportunities. And as you can see, to be very honest, we also not only made a table of the risks, but we also made a table of the opportunities because there are, of course, both sides of the medal. On the next slide, you can see, and it's quite a very um, uh, maybe shocking uh, a table. Here you can see the sectoral restrictions of foreign investments in China as compared to the EU. It's on page 19 of our review for those who are interested to read the whole review product. And there you can see that for the Chinese investment regime vis-a-vis -vis EU investors, there is always either a joint uh, venture um, only possible or a minority only or a maximum of 50% um, or a maximum of 20%. And if you then take a look at the other side, the EU investment regime vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese investors, then you see for all these sectors that there are actually no restrictions. So we are very open from the other side. We need to say that it is not really open off. I don't, I think I don't need to convince people that it is far from a level playing field. On the next slide, you can see what are we doing if we compared the 74 actions of uh, the European um, and we, uh, we verify them with the risks as you can see on the previous slide. Then you see that from the total of 74 actions contained in the three strategic documents, and we map these against our compilation of risks and opportunities. And then we found that there are three risks that are currently not addressed and not covered by an EU strategy. The first one is the risk that there is a lack of coordination between infrastructure programs of the EU and China. The second one is the risk that the EU economy is negatively impacted from shocks in, to its supply chain with key Chinese suppliers. And the third one is the risk that the public health is affected by increased interconnectedness in a globalized world. I have to say that we started our review in December 2019, and unfortunately, this risk already materialized during the review uh, process. And I can give you one example for this. The EU felt the burn of this risk where there was a shortage of masks and protective equipment for the COVID-19, and we were relying on China to provide these supplies. Um, okay, I think it could have been handled in a better way. On the next slide, you can see actually um, what is for us a, 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 a next challenge, future challenge in the EU-China relations. That is the fact that there is no money is set aside for the EU-China strategy. So there is European Union did not earmark any financing to respond to China's investment strategy. And this was contrary to what was done for other EU policies, such as the European Green Deal. And I think that is also for legitimate reasons that they earmark funding, but they haven't done it for the China to tackle or to respond to the China's investment strategy. The commission com considers that most of the EU-China actions draw upon the funding from existing programs, but we also found and this is an example here of the bridge in Croatia. We found an example where EU funds finance Chinese projects. The bridge in, in, in Croatia was funded by the EU cohesion funds. And yet it is being branded as a part of the Chinese BRI as it is built, being built by the Chinese Road and Bridge Corporation. But I would say it's maybe a good marketing from the point of view of China but maybe it could have been better from our point of view. On the next slide um, is, another, is another future challenge that we found. That is that there is a lack of monitoring and reporting, or we could ask where is the follow up. Our analysis of the 74 actions shows that almost half of the EU actions are not specifically defined and don't have targeted objectives, nor they nor do they include any deliverables to be provided. The way in which 
these actions are set up makes it difficult to monitor the process in their implementation. Setting clearer objectives and measuring their progress would make it easier to ensure that the EU addresses the challenges posed by the Chinese investment strategy. And this brings me to the last future challenge and maybe the most important one on the next slide. And that is the fact of the better coordination. Actually, I would say we need 27 players on one team and not 27 teams on uh, one player. So I think this is the most important one and it is how to better coordinate the response of the EU institutions and member states by promoting the exchange of information between them on the EU-China cooperation. As some of you know, or most of you know, is the original name of the BRI from the Chinese translation was One Belt, One Road. Our review has demonstrated that member states also act, and we all know, bilaterally with China, and that often without informing the Commission, and this has resulted in a situation that you might call one EU, 15 MOUs, as to date 15 member states, and they are shown on the, on the slide, have signed a memorandum of understanding with China on the BRI cooperation. A further threat to the EU unity is the existence of alternative channels, such as the cooperation between the China and the Central and Eastern European countries, the 17 plus one framework. Um, and in 2019, I have to say that European Commission strategic outlook described China as the EU's cooperation and negotiating uh, partner, but as well as its economic competitor and systemic rival. And I have to say that was quite a change in the wording and it is a tone shift in the EU-China relations and the tensions between these simultaneous definitions will certainly color the future EU-China relations. In our view, responding in an effective way to China's state-driven investment strategy would require member states to act together with the EU institutions as a union, because we are convinced that uh, if we talk about EU-China relationships, it would not be fair to blame the Commission for everything because I think it's, it's a shared responsibility, not only from the European Commission, but also from the member states. And I think we are convinced that if we have a better co a coordination, we can tackle much better the risks that are uh, related to that relationship, but we can also more elaborate on the opportunities that are also in this relationship. So. I would hold it um, till here. I'm open uh, to answer all your questions. I hope that we covered a lot of them, but I'm pretty sure that maybe I will receive some questions that will give us some more audit ideas for uh, the future um, uh, on these EU-China relations. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mrs. Turtlebaum. I was uh, saying you are challenging us uh, in, a, in a very special way if you indicate that whatever we come up with might end up uh, uh, justifying a new audit or a new review. But nonetheless, uh, we're, of course, taking that all in good stead. And... Um, uh, you say uh, not. Uh, we should not blame the Commission for everything. I'm not even intending to blame the Commission, even though blame, of course, belongs where it belongs. But I think Commission can speak for itself, and we have two uh, excellent representatives from Commission that will give their view now. And uh, Maria Martin Pratt, please, I would like you uh, to go first. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Budikoffer, and, and thank you uh, to Ms. Tartabon for, for her presentation. And indeed, uh, uh, the Commission uh, have broad shoulders, but should not take the blame for everything that is uh, presented or argued uh, in, in, the, in the report that we just heard uh, the main lines about. Let me 
Let me start by saying that uh, I do understand uh, the interest in the report. I think the, the, the public and the political awareness of the influence of, of China in the world uh, is, is very high and it's been growing in the last year. So in the same manner that the commission took this into account when uh, redefining its policy vis-a-vis -vis China uh, most recently in the 2019 communication on a strategic outlook uh, EU-China, uh, I think it's, it's normal that the interest is, is shared and, and that the issues looked into by, by others. So we, we acknowledge the timel timeliness of, of the court's review. And, and it is correct when it is confirming that China has an increase in international presence and that because we are talking about uh, a state-driven economy, uh, this requires a particular political attention. Now, there are uh, many conclusions that we have seen in, in, in the very long charts uh, presented. Uh, in the course report, uh, so I would certainly not uh, aim at trying to agree or disagree with each of them, but let me just uh, highlight some of them where I think uh, they are the most important ones and also to, to a large extent, I think we, we do have an agreement with, with the conclusions of the court. First of all, and it is an obvious one, but it's an extremely important one. Uh, it is very important how uh, it's uh, stressed that we need unity and cooperation between the EU and the member states when dealing with China. Uh, and I think in that respect, obviously there is always the possibility to improve the situation. I will never deny the difficulties of coordinating and, and getting a common approach among uh, 27 countries. I mean, that's, that's part of our daily job. But I also think that it's very clear that we have increased the efforts uh, to, to do that. Uh, you do have increasingly discussions about China at a senior level, not only in the Commission, but also with other EU institutions, starting by the European Parliament, but also in, in, in the Council, in the different formations of the Council. We've had uh, discussions at the leaders' level prior and after this summer. You will have, for instance, the Foreign Affairs Council trade discussing, among other issues, China on the 9th of November, and I'm just talking as to the recent past and, and future uh, events, but I think it's very, very clear. China is now part of the agenda of the institutions, and there is an effort to, to clearly uh, coordinate and ensure that, uh, that discussions are on a very regular basis. Now, a second point that was also highlighted, uh, the importance of foreign direct investment and uh, the consequences of foreign direct investment when you have at least for a number of those uh, state-driven investments. Uh, yep, I think that is correct. As regards the collection of data on FDI screening, yes, this is complex. It's complex in general. Yeah? This is not China related. I think you should start speaking by this to, to, with the statistical offices of the member states uh, so as to get a faster flow of data in terms of investment, but there is also uh, some very good reasons why in practical terms, uh, some of the data takes time to get to the statistics. Uh, but it is true to say that there is a further level of complexity in the case of China and some other jurisdictions, by the way, given the fact that there might be opaque funding mechanisms. Uh, and, and we see that uh, very clearly. I've worked very closely on issues like the uh, FDI screen regulation where, where you do uh, face that type of problems when you try to understand where is an investment coming from. Uh, this is not always uh, an, an easy issue. A problem in the case of China, a problem that goes beyond China. The Commission has spent time and money in having uh, a, a very important improvement uh, in terms of data, including base of, of uh, including data at firm level. Uh, at the level of, of companies and, and we do have projects ongoing that, that allow us to have a much better picture before us today that maybe we had a few years ago. 
Now, another point that the court does that, that I think I will not want to take that as a criticism. Uh, Europe being one of the most open investment regimes in the world. Yes, correct. And it is the foundation of our economy and it's been needed in the past and it will be needed going forward. The fact that we have an open modern economy doesn't mean that we have an innocent and defendless economy. We, we are part of the world. We are very engaged with, with the world. We are relatively small part of the world with uh, important links uh, in trade and investment. And investment creates jobs and creates prosperity and innovation in Europe. So my hope is that we can continue to have that openness while at the same time having the tools at our disposal that make sure our interests are defended, not only vis-a-vis -vis opening markets in third countries, but also when there are distortions in, in, our, in our own markets. Uh, and, and this is something that the Commission is clearly developing uh, quite actively, both in terms of bilateral engagement with China, where we try to address some of the issues you referred to as lack of reciprocity, uh, lack of uh, access to China's uh, markets, and that is uh, done uh, to, to a very important extent in the negotiations I lead on the China agreement on investment, uh, but we go beyond that. That is, is, is very clear. And we are also looking into the type of measures we need to take from a unilateral point of view, which are not an alternative to engagement with China, but a complement to make sure that they are not unjustified distortions that affect the functioning of our internal market or the competitiveness of our companies, for instance, in third countries. And this is uh, these days very much, for instance, debated around the issue of the effect of Chinese subsidies in Chinese industry and what this means in terms of investments, uh, distortions as regards investment in Euro, investments in Europe or as regards uh, investments in inter country. I do trust that um, my, my colleague uh, Inge Bernards uh, from DigiComp will, uh, will elaborate on this point because as you know, uh, the commission uh, did publish a white paper is now in the process of ref consultation of reflection as regards possible instruments to address the distortive effects that uh, foreign subsidies is, is not uh, any country specific that foreign subsidies may have in the internal market. Um, so I think I will stop here. What I'm trying to, 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 to probably leave with you is my sense that, that uh, we welcome the attention provided to, to the issue. I uh, think that a number of the comments are, are indeed worth of attention and I've tried to explain how the Commission is already paying that attention to these issues. Um, and for the rest, we, we might have issues where, where we might have uh, alternative uh, data that is worth considering, other views, but generally speaking, the concern uh, expressed by the court, which is need of unity, need of a robust policy and engagement and of a not naive uh, openness uh, if this puts us risk, at risk in an unfair manner, uh, our own uh, competitiveness in, in the internal market or in other countries or our access to, to China, I think those are points that are well taken. I hope I didn't go beyond my time, Mr. Chair. No, perfect. Thank you very much, Mrs. Martin Pratt. And I would now uh, call on Mrs. Uh, Bernertz to uh, pick it up uh, and uh, you, uh, have been reminded of the case of the Pelješac Bridge in southern Croatia, which probably was one of the experiences that motivated a commission to put forward a couple of proposals in the recent white paper. But you take it from your own perspective, please uh, take the floor. Thank you very much um, for having me uh, this afternoon on, on this and I will not already on the on the general context and indeed um, I think the increased awareness 
of the not just importance but also challenges of, of EU China relationships and and the reference that Mrs. Sturzelboom also made to our 2019 communication in which uh, we identify uh, China not only as a negotiating competitor and, and a, a systemic uh, rival. I think that very much uh, sets the, the tone. Um, one point that I would like to zoom in on, of course, from a competition perspective, is this element of level playing fields, um, which is very uh, important uh, also for us to ensure the level playing field um, as much as possible globally, but certainly also within the internal market. And um, I don't think this is a matter of a, a single silver bullet. It is a matter of combining, as Maria also said, uh, various instruments, multilateral instruments, bilateral instruments, but also we have to, uh, using our own unilateral toolbox and, and verifying constantly whether that toolbox is, is complete or not. Have our instruments in there that allow us to also look at whether um, investments from Chinese operators, whether state-driven or not, uh, distort the internal market, uh, the, the antitrust rules and the merger rules that, that we apply to companies no matter where they are based. But as soon as they are active in the EU internal market, then those um, rules of fairness in the economic uh, interaction uh, play a role. And you're right, uh, Mrs. Tuchelboom, to point out that also in that context, it is not always easy to have the data, but we have quite strong tools that we also see do have effect in the sense that we can send requests for information um, to companies abroad, but also to affiliates within Europe, impose heavy fines when those are not replied to, and do, we do see that this does enable us also to collect information uh, that we need for those investigations. But that being said, when it came to state dates, and that's of course a very relevant feature when we're talking about uh, state-driven uh, strategic investment, there we saw that, that there is this, this quite blatant discrepancy between state aid rules that only cover uh, subsidies by EU member states, but that did not cover or do not cover uh, subsidies by, by third countries. And that's why uh, we took the initiative of as commission of the EU white paper in which we consulted on, on various options. And we received um, a lot of replies that established on that basis also an inception impact assessment. And we are now shaping and preparing a legislative initiative that you see on the commission work program for the second quarter of, uh, of next year. Now, um, in the overall reactions, as I mentioned, both from the perspective of a political stakeholder, um, it's a gap in, in our toolbox. At the same time, there was a lot of expression of concern um, not to, um, do away with what Maria also highlighted as one of the key features of our European economy. We um, lack a tool to, to ensure the compatibility of the internal market, also by subsidies given by third countries, but also a clear warning not to make that instrument disproportionate and, and not to, to scare away foreign direct investments that are also very much uh, uh, welcome and needed in our uh, European economy. So what is the general approach that, that we take to say, um, of course, foreign direct investments indeed are, um, are, are needed and Europe is open to those, but they must be subject to the same type of control as also member state subsidies are subject to. Now, um, of course, there are also certain, certain differences, so the mechanism will be more difficult. Again, we'll face the, the difficulty of collecting data, of seeing through the very complex sometimes uh, structures in, in China and financing uh, flows in, in, in China. 
Um, so we have in our uh, white paper indicated several options, an option which is a more broad ex post instrument, um, an option that uh, allows us to receive ex ante notifications in particular of acquisitions um, funded with uh, Chinese or, or other foreign subsidies, um, and um, a module that specifically looks into public procurement. Um, and I think there I come, Mr. Butikofer, to the question that you asked the British the in, uh, in Croatia. Um, we are working on this uh, within the Commission to see what is the best um, means here to make sure that we can look into foreign subsidies when they are used in the context of public procurement. Also here, I think there is a balance to be made by on the one hand, making sure that you can um, look properly whether such uh, investments are distortive of the level playing field, um, whilst not unnecessarily uh, making procurement processes uh, even longer and more complex. So we are now also in a period uh, related to the economic recovery uh, COVID, where there are a lot of um, public investments being made, where we are also, and member states, reminders of that, are very keen to, to let projects also take off without unnecessary red tape. And so that, I think, is for us the key challenge in, in uh, designing the instrument, is to make sure that we have, on the one hand, an instrument that is effective, that can overcome also the difficulties around data access, whilst making sure that it's proportionate, that it does not unnecessarily add red tape, neither for, for businesses nor for administrations. Um, but that's something that we'll take into account in, in determining the scope and, and the procedures. Um, so I'll leave it to, to this in terms of, of um, my presentation, but happy also to go into more depth uh, in, the, in the debate. Thank you also, uh, Mrs. Bernertz. And uh, now, last um, but not least, uh, Miko Huatari from Berlin, from Merix. Please, Miko. Yes, indeed. And um, good afternoon to everyone. Thank, thanks a lot for the invitation. Um, and my pleasure to speak in such a distinguished round um, of also officials. And um, thanks again also, Reinhard, for um, having me. Um, can I start by um, lauding and praising, obviously, uh, first the report, but then also, I think, um, the Commission, um, I think, for the many efforts that have been taken in that space. So I think, um, in many ways, uh, we see an alignment of, um, of efforts here, both by the Court of Auditors and uh, what has been just presented by DG Trade and DG Competition colleagues. Um, I think the report tackles very important issues, and I want to highlight three here. Um, the first is the challenge of follow-up and the lack of follow-up in some uh, cases. And I would count into that basket um, uh, the, the issue that we have wonderful strategies, including a connectivity strategy, but without any actual action that is happening in that space. Um, so, but also, uh, and we all know that there has been a lot of progress made on these issues recently, um, the challenge of follow-up on, on strategic um, action that has been set out by the um, 2019 communication that has been mentioned earlier. I think that's, that's an example how things can get better uh, because there's a very close monitoring and tracking of efforts in that space. So that's good, but indeed it remains a challenge and I think we can still do better, obviously, to coordinate. Um, I also would like to stress and highlight the issue of non-coordination by member states on Belt and Road MOUs. I think that has been widely reported as a, an outcome of your um, um, study, so that's very helpful. More broadly, maybe the point that you treated Belt and Road and um, IE loans and infrastructure projects and FDI together. That's something that is important, I think, to understand the state-led or state-driven context of these types of economic activities. At the same time, it's also a challenge because we all know that our responses uh, will be happening on different levels and it's uh, sometimes a bit confusing to mix these things together. But um, uh, again, that's in the box of praising and lauding. I think it's important to see the state-led and state-driven context that motivates many of these activities and also sometimes they're quite interlinked. 
Third uh, praise that I would like to uh, issue for that report is, and by the way, also again for the Commission, um, is the, the clear understanding of a much more robust and united um, uh, um, China strategy that we all uh, seek to develop. And um, the report certainly has uh, done a great job in, in, in pointing to gaps in that space. Um, continuing my my line of praising to the competition uh, to to the commission here. Um, I mean, let's recognize we have a lot of movement in that space. Discussions about IPI, the new subsidies tool, the work of DG Trade being done on indirect distortions that we see happening through subsidies in other um, um, places, uh, free trade zones uh, in Egypt, for instance. Uh, very tough negotiations that are being led on the comprehensive agreement on investment, etc. So that's um, that's quite a lot that has happened already. It's not enough. We all know that, but um, I think it's a very, very, very important building block of what we need here. Um, before I move to um, more critical points, let me provide you with two thoughts that I have to um, share here with you as an institute with a track record and capacity on China and FDI, an issue that we've worked on quite a lot. The first point is. The big, biggest risk of all of this debate here is that we're so focused on our tools and how we shape them in, in, in very specific and appropriate ways that we are missing, I think, the big picture. And that is really the watershed and moment that we currently see in China with regard to the way how the Chinese leadership sees global interdependence um, and the strategic changes that we see happening in China these days as they sit in the fifth plan and work on their fifth uh, five-year plan and on, on the industrial policy upgrades and the 2035 strategy, etc. And I think it's extremely important that we look at the sources and origins of all of that and um, while we obviously continue to work in our toolbox and refine that. Um, so big picture questions, I think we shouldn't ignore them and it's very important to look at China what's happening there at the moment. Second point is on FDI, um, more specifically on data. Um, we have a track record of working on that with Rodin Group, which you've also cited and also provides DG Trade with data, so you all have access to that. Um, it, Chinese FDI is down dramatically, and we all know that. So, which doesn't mean that the challenge is going to go away, but I think it's important to recognize that. And, and, and it's a communication task for all of us also not to say very clearly that this is not because of our increased scrutiny of investment. It's because of domestic policies in China. It's because of currently the global FDI decline of 50%. It's actually down to developed economies 75%. So um, there's a communication task for all of us to tell the Chinese and also the public and all the diplomats, the Chinese diplomats, that Chinese FDI in Europe is not down because Europe is becoming more protectionist, uh, because that's a standard line. And um, I think we all share an interest in clarifying that this is not true. Um, also, let's recognize, because the issue of reciprocity comes up a lot in your report, and rightly so, that Chinese F uh, European FDI in China is up. Um, so that's important, and um, China will see record inflows of, of FDI in 2020, despite um, the crisis. So something is happening that we also have to recognize. Um, I'm not saying it's enough, and Maria will know more about that, um, but um, something is happening, and we should um, um, take that quite seriously. Um, I would like to highlight three issues before I close, and happy um, then to discuss these issues more in detail. Um, and my first um, criticism, if I may, is um, that it's related to the point, bigger picture challenges. I, I don't think that the three issues that you've identified as you know, risks that are not covered are the most important ones. I think the most important risk is that what we tackle with the comprehensive agreement on investment will not suffice and actually challenge in dealing with the big challenge, which is our interdependence with China under conditions of sustained non-reciprocity, strategic industrial innovation policy, uh, and the, the unfair competition that this creates on a global scale. And that we, and as Maria and others have said earlier, we'll not tackle this with the comprehensive agreement on investment. And that's, an, that's a much bigger risk than I think the three risks that you've identified as not being covered currently. 
Um, the second point is um, about the issue of state control. You operate with a definition of state control that is um, more than 50% of assets being controlled by China. I think that's quite simply outdated or at a shorthand that is not um, um, sufficient. We have a massive challenge with ownership transparency. Uh, we have a, I think, very important debate that is happening in other OECD economies about the issue of control. What does control actually mean? We have um, a big challenge in, with regard to what's happening in China in terms of the political economy of companies. So what's the role of state guidance funds, for instance, in the future, which are effectively subsidies just in a new disguise? What's the role of embedded private companies uh, that are co-opted by the state and the party uh, for industrial policy purpose? And all of these challenges, I, I don't think they're sufficiently covered in, in the um, court report. But I know that the Commission is looking at these issues quite intensively already. So that's a good sign. But I just wanted to underline once more that there's more work to be done. The political economy of China, the role of the party is changing quite dramatically at the moment. And also the leadership is rethinking its tools to actually continue or even expand the way how they try to um, in integrate themselves and also influence um, the Chinese. Um, set of companies. So from that perspective, um, again, a lot of praise for the report and the work of the Commission, but we all know it's not enough and we have to step up our game quite a lot. Thank you very much, Miko. Also, um, that um, gives us now the chance to, to move on uh, to the um, broader involvement of the participants that we have in this call. And I would uh, wanna start immediately by uh, reading to you um, a question that has been uh, sent and I will read that as it's been sent. Which areas could be most prospective to gain a consensus among EU member states on a common EU-China position? industrial sectors, e.g. healthcare and globalization, digitization and cybersecurity or common interests on human rights and economics, or science and education developments, geopolitical and military interests to stabilize EU's geographic interests and positions, or what? Where do EU member states mostly agree? Where do we face no consensus? Then I would... Uh, uh, ask a uh, question to Mrs. Turtlebaum uh, regarding uh, the different levels of your uh, review, uh, Mrs. Turtlebaum. I would basically say you, you are addressing four baskets of, of issues. One basket I would describe as the overall attitude. So dealing with China together, that's the, the kind of issues. And there, I, I would say you have found a lot of support uh, for uh, what uh, the report says. Then the question of analysis, there the, uh, the um, criticism from uh, uh, Miko has been that maybe the uh, lack of analysis is more in the um, big picture uh, issue on the big picture issues. I would like you to pick that up. Then you deal with policy. There, uh, both Mrs. Martin Pratt and uh, Mrs. Uh, Berert uh, said that, and I th think justifiably so, that Commission has been moving on quite a few um, uh, very important topics. And then you, you talk about administrative effectiveness. Uh, and there you, you found some support, but not overwhelming support, I would say, in, in the reactions that have been given by our three experts. So maybe you would want to, to be more specific in that regard when you say that more than 40% of the actions that have been identified have not seen any meaningful follow-up. Which of these actions would you say are the most important ones where we would need uh, a uh, uh, follow-up, not somewhere in the future, but pretty soon? Let's start with those two questions 
I would ask the first question to all uh, the, the, the panelists and, and start with Mrs. Turtlebaum uh, to, to also address the second question, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it is, of course, we don't, uh, how shall I say, we, we haven't made a ranking, but in our view, and if you read our report uh, very carefully, or very carefully, or what you see in our report is, it is true what um, has been said by, by, uh, by Miko is that uh, the materiality is at this moment about 3%. Is this is not that high. But we still think that we need to do a follow-up because it are state-owned uh, enterprises. And maybe the definition is not completely correct or not completely up to date, but I have to say it's, a, it's the definition that we have used from the European Commission side. So then I think that maybe the European Commission should update their uh, definition. Uh, but nevertheless, although it's only about 3%, I think there need to be a follow-up of all these investments. Why? Because they are state-owned enterprises. And secondly, because they are in strategic sectors, often in telecommunication, in infrastructure, in energy. And these are sectors that are of extremely importance. So the amount of about 3% is not that high, but the sectors are actually very critical infrastructure sectors that are important. If you ask me, what are the actions that should be uh, the most important? I also agree what has been said with the three risks that we, when we mapped the four, 74 actions with our risk and opportunity analysis, we saw that there were three risks that were not covered. But of course, there are other risks in the table, in the table one that I showed during my presentation, that are actually as important. And for me, mainly the lack of reciprocity is a big problem. I, I showed it uh, during the, the, when I gave that graph with or the analysis with all the sectors and how open Europe is towards Chinese investments, but not the other way around. And actually I am not criticizing Europe for being open or we are not criticizing Europe for being open. We can maybe more criticize China for the fact that they are way too close for our Euro European companies and for our European enterprises. So that is actually, I think that the lack of reciprocity is the, the most harm, is, is the most important from my point of view uh, from, and from a European uh, perspective. If you ask me, because I asked also, I, I try to answer the two questions in the chat as well, uh, but I can, I could not, 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 um, uh, not give it too much in detail, because they asked also at a certain moment, um, where do the EU member states mostly agree on, where and where do we face no cons, uh, consensus? There is a problem that actually we did not audit the member states itself. So in our report, we only highlight three risks that are not addressed. So we think that these are important. And if there should be a coordination, who should do it? Then we think it should be the commission services and the, the, the external action who should, who should address these, these uh, questions. But having said that, I think that um, um, and I will, I will maybe uh, announce something or, or tell you something. So we will, uh, I will also start an audit on the cybersecurity on 5G. We adopted just today um, uh, the APM, so our, our audit uh, program uh, methodology. And uh, there we also see, we mentioned in our audit scope that there are diverging opinions and approaches among the member states. And that can make it actually very difficult to address uh, 5G security challenges and that, uh, that the European Commission might face exactly the same problem of coordination and of elaborating the, 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 the actions in a timely manner. So I'm wondering, this was a review product for the 5G audit, it will be a re real audit report. So then we can go more into detail of what is happening in certain member states. So then it can give me some insights 
on whether where are the diverging opinion on 5G in the member states and where they all uh, agree upon. We just started this uh, audit. So for the European Parliament to say it will only be finished like in approximately uh, one year. But it is actually a follow up of this review product. And but if you ask me what is the main uh, to answer your question very clearly, what is the main problem to tackle then is for me the lack of reciprocity. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Totalbaum. Um, Mrs. Martin Pratt, um, where do you find the, the, the best opportunities for policy coherence uh, between member states? I think that was the question that was directed at everybody. But feel free to make any other comments you might see uh, uh, useful, please. Uh, uh, thank you. And uh, yeah, I think you, you summarized the, the question in, in the right manner. And on, on that point, I think uh, it is the case that in particular in the last two to three years, we have seen a greater engagement from member states and more willingness to have common approaches for certain policy areas vis-a-vis -vis China. Uh, we did work together, for instance, on the issue of uh, the screening of foreign direct investment for purposes of security and public order, where at the start of, of the process, there were doubts from a good number of member states as to the need to have a common approach uh, to, to, to this. And by the end of it, it was very clearly, and it is even more clear as we, as we develop uh, the policy now that Europe is convinced of the need to have a screening of foreign direct investment for purposes of security and public order, very clearly. I'm leaving aside also future developments for other purposes like uh, uh, distorting subsidies, but, but on this, while at the same time noting this is not China specific, it's very clear that, that there is a willingness of member states to, to work together. There is the willingness of member states as well to work together on improving the situation as regards uh, issues such as uh, the effects of subsidies, uh, the effects of uh, the weight and the interventions of state-owned enterprises uh, in, in the economy, not only in China, but in, in Europe and third countries. Uh, the problems related to FT, uh, forced technology transfer, all, all these are issues where I think uh, there is a, a clear understanding from member states that we need to, to, to work together. Working together doesn't always need to work together uh, against someone else. Eh? I think it's very, very clear that we also think that we need to work together and together with China on, on issues that can be from the reform of the WTO to addressing challenges related to climate and the environment or to uh, the effects uh, in health of the current pandemic and attempts to try to address, uh, address uh, issues such as the development and distribution of vaccines. So um, I, I think uh, we we have on the side of member states more of an understanding that we need to work together. That does not make things always easy or the coordination perfect uh, far from that. Uh, on a general point, there is something I, I wanted to, to highlight and is related with what Nico said in his intervention at, towards the end, which I think is very important, uh, which is the need to the need to stay very attentive as to developments in China. Let's not by talking as to what has been happening in the last years, uh, lose sight of how fast things are developing and how the picture may be changing in China, not only necessarily because of uh, China's internal, uh, let's say, uh, dynamics, but also because of the world having become a very complex uh, and challenging place uh, in, in many instances. So we, we need to be attentive when we're talking about the EU-China policy, not only to assess the problems we have been assessing so far, but to understand very fast what's happening. 
uh, because I think there are new challenges that are coming up, uh, whether it is in terms of uh, effective or not, the coupling in certain areas, uh, less reliance, less integration. Uh, there are issues there that are going to be um, a challenge as well for us, and that we need to that we need to take into account when we develop our or continue to develop our China policy. Thank you very much, Mrs. Bernertz. Same question to you also. Yeah, thank you, and and um, largely the same answer, I think, but with some new. Are willing to engage is indeed a better understanding also of of, of that's the big big picture issue to understand really um, what is going on um, have 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 data on that understand the strategy and and have also a broad coordinated European strategy to put um, um, as a counterbalance to that uh, Chinese strategy I think on that. There is a, a large degree of, of, of uh, where it is in, in uh, common interest, um, like, for example, what Maria mentioned, um, the fight against climate change. I think there, honestly, a very good progress has been uh, made with the full support of, of, of member states to, to engage there also China in, in, in the Paris Agreement to explore uh, what else is, is, is possible. I, I also agree with Maria that um, from a uh, perspective under the FDI instrument or from a level playing field uh, perspective as with the, with the future uh, third country subsidies tools. Um, this being said, um, I think with the FDI instrument, um, the mechanism of cooperation has now entered into force earlier this month. Let's see what it, what it will bring. And, and I'm personally confident that as we start to work together on concrete cases, that this will also um, build the trust and, and the cooperation and the common knowledge and understanding. Um, but I also think that we are not there yet, if you see that, that not all member states have have the eye screening mechanisms yet. Um, and that also I think the, yeah, in the regulation as it was created, um, there would have been scope to, to go even, even further. But let's see how we can build on, on what we have today and, and how we can develop this uh, further, both in terms of FDI screening and in terms of third country investment screening. Where I think um, it, it, it does become um, more problematic and, and um, the Court of Auditors has pointed to that also in the slides is when we see, for example, the number of um, bilateral investment agreements that are being concluded without even uh, the transparency around it. I think those are very worrying uh, patterns. Uh, you mentioned uh, Mr. Butikofer, I worked indeed in the energy sector before. And that's also something that we had seen from other international players, notably from Russia, as a deliberate strategy to um, negotiate such bilateral um, um, IGAs with member states. And, and we've seen also how difficult it is once those IGAs are in place to, to then uh, um, get out of those. So I think this is a, is a worrying issue to be followed closely in the energy field. There was a sector specific instrument created um, giving also some ex ante uh, checks and, and controls over such agreements. Uh, I don't know how far we can uh, go on, on a cross-sector basis, but I do think this is some... ...on, on whether instruments are, are needed there, uh, continue to do further work. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Bernertz. Uh, Nico, um, same question to you, and, and I want to um, emphasize um, one particular element of that, and this is um, uh, regarding the, the lack of follow-up that you also mentioned. I mean, we should not generalize, but for instance, 
when when I look at our connectivity strategy, it's still uh, like a, a car without wheels because there's no funding basically, and there's no no practical implementation. And now the uh, commission has decided that connectivity strategy will not be part of the work program of 2021 because as some high ranking people seem to believe not much has changed over the last two years with regard to connectivity and uh, in particular also China. So why, uh, why um, um, do, do uh, give new efforts? How do you see the, uh, the um, opportunities for really member states coming together uh, on strategically mandated priorities, like for instance, connectivity. What, what's the missing link there? Thank you, Rainer, that's a challenging question. I think um, to some extent it's, and I'll be probably a bit impolite or provocative here, I think it's, it's still in many ways a lack of strategic um, foresight with regard to the competitive challenges that we are facing, not only in our bilateral relationship, but with regard to global competition with China. So the expansion of unfair trading and investment practices to third countries and the scale of that, the speed of that, and the implications of that, no, not only for, you know, from a corporate perspective that you're competing with a vertically integrated um, um, state sector in many ways, but um, also the, the challenges of that for much broader and more important issues, the question of the future of multilateralism. So basically OECD versus Belt and Road countries, the question of standard setting uh, in, in the most comprehensive way. Um, so I, I, to some extent, I think it's still quite simply a, a lack of understanding or foresight with regard to the competitive challenge that we face. More practically, I think it's, it's, it's a challenge with regard um, to the coordination of member states um, that needs to happen and that needs to mandate and push the commission, which would be extremely willing, I think, in many ways, as it has shown in the past, to tackle these issues and move forward. Um, so, um, you know, if you look back at why we have moved forward on IPI or on um, uh, investment screening, it was because uh, important member states have decided um, that the Commission should be able to do what they wanted to do anyway. Um, so um, that's one part of the answer. The other part, I think, is, is Commission coordination internally. Uh, we all know that not every DG is moving in the same direction on issues such as the connectivity strategy. Um, so you need someone with a political standing, a strategic perspective, and a clear, uh, and the power in, in his hands um, or her hands to push these things forward um, against the will of some of the, the other DGs. Uh, so that needs to happen on the highest level. It basically needs to happen, I think, um, um, with a mandate of uh, Ursula von der Leyen. Otherwise, things will not progress. Um, now, you can talk about the role of the EP in all of this, um, which probably is an important one. Um, but let me just make one more and slightly separate point. Um, as uh, building on what Ms. Bernans has just said about the importance of the FDI screening framework and mechanism that has come into force. So again, a reason to applaud, I think, many of the actors here in this um, room. Um, this is a sign of, uh, I think, in many ways, the possibility progress, but at the same time, also of how much we are probably behind the curve um, to some extent. So FDI screening needs to be part of a much broader process and picture um, where we look at technology uh, leakage and dual use issues. And, you know, we are also moving forward now on export controls. I don't think that the level of ambition of the proposal that we currently have in that will suffice for us to navigate the strategic landscape where emerging technologies are inherently dual use. Um, we, we have, and I hope we will have progress on surveillance technology, but that's not the end of the story. And we'll come under much more pressure I think um, from like-minded partners also to move forward on these issues, rightly so, I think in many ways. And we, we have to operate in a new landscape where China is issuing new, new export control measures, the United States mm -hmm. is issuing new export control measures. And I think um, uh, Europe's role obviously is to navigate that new landscape. So investment screening interlinked with export controls measures, venture capital, licensing. Um, so there's, there's a space where I think um, we've done quite a lot already 
and we have to integrate this thinking about emerging technologies and dual use purposes much more than we have in the past and that needs to happen on member state level but also on the uh, commission level obviously thank you miko i have more questions that have been put in the f and a uh, section uh, so uh, if you want to also ask questions uh, don't hesitate to take that opportunity and I will read these questions to our panelists. One question that is directed at either Maria Martin Pratt or Inge Bernertz uh, is this, do you see any enthusiasm or appetite among OECD members to pursue a similar playbook in addressing China's st state-driven investment strategy. A second question uh, is from uh, my colleague Miriam Lexmann from the Parliament, and she asks, it was released by Deutsche Welle that the European Parliament has bought technology from a Chinese company, Hikvision, that has been linked to the oppression of Uyghurs. Don't you think that these kind of companies belong on a sanctioned list and that the EU institutions should have a lead in a principled public procurement. Um, I will give this question to Miko because I, I, I think our uh, um, commission officials uh, might uh, want to budge that. And the third question is from uh, uh, the following on transparency in China. A question for Maria Martin Pratt. As you mentioned, state intervention is sometimes opaque. There is a parallel level of governance through the Communist Party. So how trustworthy are commitments that China makes in the bilateral investment treaty? Can we be certain that for every opening on paper, there won't be a new informal barrier coming up? And for uh, Inge Bernertz, the same question, how would the foreign the new foreign subsidies mechanism deal with a lack of data on financing and subsidies. Please, I would propose that maybe um, Maria Martin Pratt goes first. Um, okay, thanks. Thanks very much, and and thanks uh, for giving uh, to Miko the uh, practices of the European Parliament and public procurement. Uh, that's that's really uh, very kind vis the Commission, but as, as regards uh, the question related to the OECD uh, countries, I mean, the, the, the OECD traditionally has played a very important role in discussions about investment. Uh, it, it is an international uh, institution that regularly discuss and has an investment committee that, that is the OECD. Some, some extent, uh, it's been more active in a good number of things than than that, for instance, WTO. So there are uh, discussions there within uh, the function and the tools that the OECD have on issues such as uh, FBI screening, very clearly, but but uh, also now on on other uh, related issues and and technology and export control is is going to be part of, of of that discussion. So there is a willingness to 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 discuss these issues in the OECD, which is not necessarily saying that there is a willingness to embark in new rules uh, there. And then there is another thing that I think is very very important. Uh, new rules, in particular, when we are talking about uh, a world where there is interdependency and trade, if we want rules of the games for everybody, we also need to involve China. So it's, 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 it's again the point I've been trying to make, which is you, you need a complex toolbox that includes bilateral and unilateral. Uh, so in, the, in that respect, uh, we also need to have a four-hour discussion for, for new rules, for an update of rules that includes China. That, in my view, is clearly the WTO. Uh, in terms of uh, commitments, uh, trade war, these, I think there are two questions there. When we, when we question, is someone that is taking a commitment with us, with us trustworthy? Uh, look, that is a very, very big question, and I could also give examples of other partners that have taken commitments 
for not to do certain things that, that have done them. So breach of international law uh, of trade rules happens and is not something that is only done uh, by by uh, by one or the other country. Uh, I think what what the question maybe wanted in particular to say is, can we address on the basis of rules some of the problems that we see on the ground in China because of the more informal way in which uh, certain things may happen or the difficulty to sometimes capture influence that may end up in a very clear obstacle for our investors or a lack of uh, level playing field or a discrimination, even if you don't see that uh, reflected in the specific rules. And that's a challenge. That has always been a challenge. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Bernert. Uh, we have about 10 minutes max left uh, for the rest of the conversation. So please, if you would take maybe three so that we can also uh, include the other panelists, please, Mrs. Bernert. We'll focus on the specific question to, to me on how we will, in the foreign subsidies mechanism, deal with the, the lack of data on financing and subsidies, um, which is in, indeed a, a, a challenge. On the other hand, of course, the idea is that we create also for this instrument the necessary investigative that we use also in our other instruments and, and that there too have been successful, including when it comes to obtaining information on, on, um, on companies um, in, in China. It's not straightforward as um, when it comes to, to companies in, in the EU, but, but it can be done. Personally, I also think that uh, because of the difficulty of data access, it's important that we keep module two of the white paper on the uh, table and uh, look into targeted uh, transactions for which we want to have ex ante notifications so that through those notification forms and with heavy patterns of uh, incomplete or wrong information being transmitted that we get and that information in, in a piece of format will enable us to look at those transactions that are I think uh, you only have to work with um, ex post um, investigations and the data problem will be more, will be bigger than uh, if we also develop this ex ante notification uh, module that's foreseen in, in, in the white paper. Thank you. Thank you. Miko, would you take up the, the issue that Miriam Lexman raised, please? Hello. I don't know what's happening here. I can hear I, you. <laughs> I see Mrs. Turtlebaum. No, I can hear I you. saw Maria Martin Prat, I saw Mrs. Bernert. I don't see I, I can I can hear you. Yeah. Miko, are you still there? Look, uh, I I would look, we're we're short on time. Uh, we have a few minutes left. I, I think we, we should do the following. There is um there is one new question. Um, uh, that goes to Mrs. Bernert, uh, that's a follow-up uh, to, to the question that you just uh, took on. Um, uh, the, the question is simple. Would there be uh, a necessity to have additional investigative powers? And 
which such investigative powers might be necessary. If you want to uh, to address that in, in, in a minute or so. Yeah, I think the, the new uh, tool that we would create and that would enable us to look into subsidies uh, by third countries would probably require similar uh, investigation tools that we also have when it comes to state aid by, by member states to start with um, requests for information notification forms with, with sanctions. Uh, um, in this case, because contrary to, to the EU state aid system, there we are talking about member states who do the notifications. In the third country subsidies uh, regime, the, the notification would have to be done by, by the companies concerned, which then also allows us to follow up um, with, with, uh, with sanctions, if that's what, what co uh, legislators will, will decide to do. But I think from our perspective as commission, it's important that indeed we do get the necessary investigative uh, instruments to, to enforce um, the instrument and to make it effective, because otherwise we only risk creating expectations which we won't be able to, to live up to. So this is an important part of the proposal to, to make sure that the necessary um, teeth are there as well for, for this to be um, much more than, than a paper tiger. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Miko, I, I see your back, uh, so maybe you could Jump in. Yes, and apologies. And I might have missed the most important point here. But um, and uh, regarding the question of procurement of surveillance technology, um, as it has been uh, discussed earlier, if I understood it correctly, um, obviously I think that's a case in point for the issue, uh, the urgent need to integrate different tools that we have when we start ramping up export controls uh, with regard to surveillance technologies that are. Um, because of the massive human rights violations in China, particularly in the region of Xinjiang, which are related to, I think, the dramatic buildup of a surveillance state in China. Um, obviously, we should also look at procurement from companies that are implicated in these um, uh, developments. Um, and Hikvision um, and DGI drones, uh, cameras, etc. obviously are, are very important uh, cases here. Um, so, Again, apologies if I've missed the issue, but I think it's a very clear case that uh, we need to look at these issues in an integrated fashion, and we should not procure from companies that are implicated in massive human rights violations. And that is the case, I think, for everyone who does surveillance in Xinjiang. And if that's the case for Higvision, I think um, the EP has some homework to do. Yeah, I think both Miriam and I agree with that. And, and... Quite a few colleagues have been extremely angry about hearing that news, and, and we are addressing the president of the parliament uh, to, to try to make amends. Uh, before we come to the conclusion, uh, we have uh, very few minutes left, four minutes left. So I would like to give Mrs. Tuttlebaum the opportunity of making wrapping up remarks for three minutes, Mrs. Tuttlebaum, then I will take the last minute to say goodbye. Okay, thank you very much. A lot has already been said, but I just wanted to uh, come back to, to uh, two aspects. It's first a bilateral investment treaty, I think, and we also write it in our review uh, that all member states except Ireland concluded BITs with China, and now the EU is aiming to replace these with one single uh, EU-China bilateral investment. So I think that is really a very good thing. So we see that all of us, and I think we are all on the same page also during this webinar, that we need to go towards more coordination. When it is concerning the FDIs, we also, I would also like to refer in our review where we uh, say that it's a little bit the same. There are 15 member states who signed bilaterally an MOU with China, but it is actually also a little bit the same with the FDIs. Uh, the EU framework is only on grounds of security and public order. And there are uh, 40 member states who also made an, um, who established an FDI screening mechanism on a bilateral basis. So I think this is all not going, how shall I say, uh, like we say in, in one of the recommendations, at least you need to exchange information. And that's the reason 
why I'm very happy that I'm allowed to do a report on the 5G G security, because then I can see, I will be able to see among the member states who is exchanging which information, because the first step of coordination and working together is exchanging information. And then that can be a step stone. And I think on that exchange of information, the FDI toolbox, the FDI tool, the 5G toolbox can be very interesting and the FDI screening mechanism as well. And if we start with that, then I think our EU-China relationships can become maybe a little bit more balanced than they are nowadays. Thank you very much. That gives me um, um, the opportunity to make five final remarks. First and foremost, I wanna thank you, Mrs. Turtlebaum, not just for participating, but also for breaking the news that you are going to do another um, review uh, or audit on the 5G issue. We're, we're all looking forward to that. Thanks for uh, sharing that information. I also want to thank, of course, the, the three uh, excellent panelists. Thanks a lot to them. Then, uh, uh, borrowing language from Vince Lombardi, I would say unity among EU member states and EU institutions vis-a-vis uh, -vis China is not everything, it's the only thing. Uh, third, uh, we, we need to make sure that for all the practical problems and the differentiated issues that we have, we don't uh, lose the, the, the big picture analysis priority. Uh, fourth, I would... Uh, uh, would argue that uh, it's also important not just to look at bilateral relations or the triangle between the US, China, and the EU, but also at other countries and how they play a role and how they are involved. And finally, it is, of course, important to walk the talk and not just have nice strategies and nice analysis, but also be practical. And in that regard, uh, I'm grateful for the work that is being done uh, in commission. I would say, as far as I can tell from my vantage point, we have made a lot of progress over the last few years and the contribution from all sides is very welcome to make more progress. So I wanna thank all the uh, speakers. I wanna thank all the participants Wish you a good evening. Please stay safe and uh, stay involved. Uh, thanks uh, again. Bye bye. Thank you. Good bye -bye. evening. Thank you. Good evening.